Hey everybody, it's Alyssa. Super excited you guys tuned in tonight. We got an op awesome episode. We're revealing our 1969 Hemi Roadrunner convertible, one of one. So keep watching. Just <laughs> cars. In 1968, Plymouth introduced the Roadrunner. By 1969, it was their top selling muscle car of all time, also garnering the Motor Trend Car of the Year Award. This turquoise 426 Hemi convertible is the only one in the world made like it. The body and paint is done, the drivetrain's installed. All we have left is a wheel alignment and a systems check. And this car will be back on the road again. This time on Graveyard Cars, the ghouls are getting ready to reveal their rarest Mopar yet, the 1969 Q5 turquoise Hemi Roadrunner convertible. With the interior, exhaust, and the steering wheel needing to be assembled and installed, it's all hands on deck with Dave, Alyssa, Mark, and even Royal. Also, Mark and Alyssa catch up with Ryan on the Superbird Tribute Car. But before the owners show up to see their newly restored, one-of-a-kind Hemi Roadrunner, Alyssa tries talking her dad into letting her drive it. So, will Mark let his daughter drive a one-of-one -one convertible worth a half a million dollars? Stay tuned and find out on this episode of Graveyard Cars. They're coming to get you, Barbara. It has been a step in a step. The buried dead, buried dead are coming back to life. I'm Mark Warman, and together we bring dead muscle cars back to life. To exactly the way they were on the day they were born. In case you were busy towing your friend's Camaro last week, here's what you've missed. Dave and Alyssa installed the dash in everybody's fabled favorite, the 446 barrel Phantom Cuda. Mark dispatched a dutifully documented Dodge Demon to the Dipper. Then he and Royal took an off-road trip down memory lane. Alyssa and Will surprised Mark for Father's Day with a perfect die-cast reproduction of his first Mopar, a 1970 Dodge Charger in FK5 burnt orange with a white vinyl top. And Mark revealed his top secret plan to completely build a CUDA in four months, what Mark calls Operation Firepower. The trick is to kind of pre-fit your door panels to make sure you can get everything in there. And uh, I kind of go through and poke all my holes in the, in the moisture barrier at first. This is just a really unique car, you know, one of one. And I wouldn't blame the owner. I'd do it as close to original as I possibly could too. The Roadrunner basically was just a, a go fast, you know, race car type of thing. You know, it was for the low budget, you know, guys that wanted to go out and, you know, have fun in their car. So it's, the base model was just, uh, you know, a two-door hard top, or you can get a two-door post. So no frills, you know, just had some call outs, you know, and some stripes on them and stuff. They sold a ton of the 69 Roadrunners. I mean, they, I forget the base price was like around 2,600 bucks, 2,800 bucks. Uh, now that I got the driver's side door all buttoned up and, and, and finished, I'll go ahead and move over to the passenger side door and start getting the door panel and all the hardware on it as well. While Dave finishes up the Roadrunners doors, Mark and Alyssa check in with Ryan in the body shop to gauge the progress of the Superbird tribute car and to look at some of the finer points of detail on the Superbird's headlights. Our Plymouth Superbird tribute car is out in the body shop. Uh, it's already been primered one time, blocked, and now it's ready for another primer. With any luck, that'll be the last primer before the car's actually ready to paint. That car's going FJ5, which is the limelight green. I wanted to take a minute just to kind of go over some of the things that made make the Superbird as difficult, truly, as it is when it comes to building one from scratch like we did in this case. The nose itself has already been primered. All of the pieces that make it up is something that I wanted to share with Alyssa. This is the completed unit that you would buy if you were gonna buy like a used assembly with all the pieces in it. It's got okay. the actuator on it, it's got the can itself, it's got the end plates. If you look, this is part of the end of the pivot 
So it has this plate here with a nylon bushing in it. These are all really nice. If you were just restoring one of these cars, you would take this, this unit apart. Right, this is the original. Okay. You'd detail it, rebuild it, and together as a unit, you'd walk back here. And you would basically install that. Yeah. I mean, it's, it's not perfectly yeah, up against it. Yeah, but I see it. what you're saying. But I'm saying that's one great big unit. What we get from Janik so on the after we can't buy that unit anymore. You would probably pay $2,500 for a headlight, maybe $3,500 <clears throat> just for this oh, headlight wow. bucket okay. if you could find it. So instead, we bought the kit from Janik. When we bought that kit, it had to be completely assembled. Uh, Ryan, if you've got a minute. These were templates, correct? Yes, it was just a, a blank sheet that gave you a diagram to cut these out. Okay to build these steel plates. So it was a template to make it out of steel. To make it out of steel. So you can put the actuator on. Now what we have is we have this, simulated this. Yeah. And then since this here screws into sheet metal, it'll hold together. But we made a bonding strip. Because ours is fiberglass. fiberglass. We can't screw into fiberglass. We made this plate here, which I bonded in. So we have a stud plate for strength. Beautiful. To hold it in place. And now you just put your nuts on there and you've got exactly the same amount of strength, if not more, than this one had. Correct. It's such a multitude of parts. It's not just an erector set that you're bolting together, but you do have to make modifications to it. This plate here is made out of fiberglass, which is a very nice piece. But we needed this mount here for the end of this actuator to clip on to, to clip on to which to drag pushes that it door up down. okay also this metal plate here holds this the springs that adjust the headlights so we had to fab this here because the kit did not come with this no okay so you would need to make this piece yes and this little bracket in the middle which is almost identical to the one that the factory had yes but then the rest of this is the original fiberglass that you just had to cut out. Just had to cut out all the there holes. There were marks here, but you had to cut the actual oh, wow. holes themselves. Correct. But it's a phenomenal kit. The, the Janik reproduction is amazing. Everything is there except for just a couple little intricate pieces. The passenger door is all done, got all the hardware on, door panel. Looks fantastic. Uh, now I get to put that really nice piece of uh, bling on there, that beautiful polished sill plate and they go right in this area here and they just look fantastic. You can see it just totally sets off that color of this car. You know, it's too bad this car doesn't have just a ton of chrome on it. I mean, it's got a lot of stainless around the windshield, but every little piece of chrome we put on this car just really sets it off. I kind of look at it and see, you know, you want a little bit of carpet over your pinch weld there because you want it to set down. I got to back cut this carpet here a little bit, and then I want to cut the carpet so it'll expose where all my screw holes are. Right where this sewn uh, seam is right here on the carpet, it's really thick. So you put that on top of another layer of carpet and it's super thick. And then that sill plate's not gonna sit all the way flush. Whenever you start to screw it down, it's gonna actually put a kink in it on the top. So I kind of put a little relief cut in there and take a little bit of that out. And what that'll do is it'll allow it to uh, sit down a little bit better for me. So this I'll actually use on the pinch weld and the other one I'll cut just on the inside of the pinch weld. We're ready to get our scuff plate in here. Uh, these use a pan head screw. It's kind of a cool screw. It's a stainless screw. Yeah, we try to replicate the, the fasteners the best we can. You know, a lot of them, you know, I think aren't perfect. That's why you can never, never beat the original thing. Uh, that looks fantastic. The car's really coming together. It's starting to look like a, a true muscle car now. Where'd you get the original headlights? Those are out of one of our customer cars that we're doing right now, which okay. is great that we have some original examples to go by. But we're not gonna actually use these? No, the these go back to his car. They'll get restored and put back when we do his car. Oh, okay. But they were, they were already out and they were already on the shelf, so I'm using them as a template, which is great because yeah. there's a lot of pieces that make this crazy thing up. The amount of work that Ryan put in to fabricate is where I would get lost at. I mean, it's a lot easier to sit there with the original one and be able to put it together because you do have that to reference, which is a huge amount of help. You can kind of see help. how it came apart and it goes right exactly. back together. This stuff was all sort of new. So this is all bolted together like this in the car and see, then it pivots and... Just like the factory one does. This piece here, which I have the kit headlight doors, 
So that's the okay. duplicate of what we've got so there. So this is a duplicate. And it will pivot. And then he's going to be able to close that door close like that. That's awesome. And that ends him up with what we have here. Essentially there, yeah. There's such a learning process, like with any of this stuff. And no two cars are the same, so expect the unexpected. Ryan, would you say this is the most complicated part of making a Roadrunner into a Superbird? It's one of them. It's been a good journey. It's a, a learning experience. Uh, it's a puzzle. Yeah. This is probably um, the biggest puzzle, like the wing. It goes on kind of, it's basically a big part. Yes. The nose cone, we kind of get it. The, the hood the modification, but this is pretty big. This is to have to make function and withstand usage. So this will go on to that. This will be a complete headlight unit. He's already got the vacuum pods that go on the back of it. And that's what goes into making just one headlight function on one of these cars. But it's right in the spirit of the factory one, just a little bit better in some ways. What so. more could you ask for? It was fairly crude from the factory. It's fairly crude now. We just kind of, I think, expounded on that a little bit, made it just a little bit better. I think we probably put more thought process into restoring the cars than they did probably originally on some of these smaller things, oh, it like has the to. headlights. Sure, yeah, absolutely. So basically, you've got this thing apart right now so that Will can do the primering on all the pieces. Correct. Get them painted, get the nose back together again, and then the nose goes on as one unit. Is that correct? Yes. Yes. I might feel more comfortable about building one in the future than uh, than I was when this project started. All right, so that's where we're at on that. Got it? Simple. Yeah. Clear as mud. Okay. <laughs> all right, good job. So with all the pieces done, Will needs to do his primer work on them. Once the primer work's done, he can paint them. Meanwhile, the car will get its final block. It can come in here, get torn apart, and we'll start painting some FJ5. Hang on. Okay, here you go. If you think you have a solution to the problem, you're part of the problem. No, serious, man. That's funny stuff. It doesn't matter if it's dark. It's not. Uh, hang on. I got somebody else calling in. I'm gonna introduce you to uh, Click and Buzz. Have you met them yet? <laughs> Click us. Well, they don't like my Who was that? There's a paper out of Florida was doing an article because the new season's coming out. It doesn't matter. Okay. Thank you. Anyway, throw your stuff. Awesome possum. All right. What's going on? Any shorter shorts available or is um, that it? Oh, no. I wish. If you, yeah, These are if, actually big on me, but. Yeah, I know. Yeah. If you could get something that just covered the sphincter, that would be great. I come by in a thong tomorrow if you prefer. No, I prefer no. you wear so you pants like every should, other girl. Probably every shouldn't other complain about what I come in. In with. history, but you know, what? I'm whatever. It worked for Daisy Duke. I dress myself. It, it did worked really for Daisy well. Duke for really well. Yeah, yeah. She's like she. She didn't have a butt. You really want to? <laughs> <laughs> I'm glad it did, don't you? Anyways, I'm. I've noticed you're really busy. What well, I'm no, here. I'm what going... can I do to help you? I'm here to help you. Oh, I believe, believe you're me, here right? to help me. Yeah, I believe you're here to help me, Colonel Jessup. Yes. There are 82 cars out back that all need to be gone over. Okay, well, hold on before you go there. We have the Roadrunner. People coming up to pick up the Roadrunner tomorrow. So I'm sure that's like top of the list on what we need to get well, done. We, we need to test drive the woods it. On, yeah. I Dave's need to go busy. On Will's busy. I wouldn't trust So I can help you out and I can take it. it on a test drive if you would like. What are you talking about? What do you think? RM27J9G. One of one, 1969 Hemi Roadrunner convertibles and sea foam turquoise with an automatic transmission, a half a million dollar car. You would like to take it out on its maiden voyage? I'm here to help you. Well, driving the car is no That's choice. That's not a choice. That's not a choice, Nadine. Nice. Oh, Ever since you did, you, you look like Nadine. You look like don't Nadine from the stand after she had sex with the devil. Remember? Her hair turned no, white and gray like that. How do you She's like your dead. steak? Just walk it through a warm room, she says to him. I can't do it. He's a righteous man, baby. Nadine, Mother Abigail says, mayhap you is, mayhap you ain't. You know?
Dave brought me over. He's got the system now, the exhaust system from Accurate Exhaust for our 69 Hemi Roadrunner. This is a replica of the original exhaust. Originally, they were mild steel. This system is mild steel. The owner of this car doesn't want any fancy schmancy late model weird stuff. He wants it to look, function, and appear as it did in 1969. Yeah, the Accurate Exhaust does a great job, you know, with these systems. They're, they're, all their welds and everything's spot on. All the bends are spot on. All right, yeah. So first thing we're gonna do is we always build the exhaust from the front back. Yeah. So we're gonna put the H pipe on. And yeah, these are always tricky because oh of the God. torsion bars, am I right? Yeah, <laughs> they're, they're tough ones. So I'll kind of help you support the back here. You kind of tow me up, down. I'm gonna, move, and, I'm gonna move that bottom bolt out a little. There we go. Okay. Boy, my chubby little hands hardly fit in here, you know what? Oh, it's, it's tight in there. It is tight, that torsion bar. good grief. If I had the exhaust from the get-go, I would have put it on before the torsion bars. Would have been Ooh, great. Oh yeah, wouldn't that have been yeah. nice, yeah. Okay, you're Back really... in the day, it's right there, huh? Yep, yeah, there it goes. Oh, get her? Good job. Nice. So right now we've got the H-pipe installed, which is always a little bit harder over on that right side with the heat riser, but it's in place. Something to point out, this is the original mild steel that they're made out of, all right, from the factory. It's not the late model stainless stuff, it's not the aluminized. This is the original type of material that this exhaust was built out of. So it will rust a lot quicker than aluminized or stainless, but it's what the owner wanted. He wanted it to look, appear, and function sound exactly the way it did in 69. So that's what you see set in here. Tom down at Accurate, he, he builds every one of these, breaks every one himself, bends every one, welds every one. Right now we got our H pipe on, which is the main pipe that bolts to the manifolds. We have the mufflers on and they're just kind of mocked into place. So now we're getting ready to put the over the axle pipes on and the resonators and tips. Oh, look at that. Bad boy just slide right Whoop. on there. Nice. Niz nice. I call it niz nice. Niz nice. Niz nice. All right. A little much coffee Some this more. morning. Getting kind of crazy <laughs> out here. Like to have a little fun. That's all right. Coffee is good. And now we've got everything mocked into place. Every single piece. We're going to go to the front of the car. We're going to start at the head pipe. We're going to start bolting it down. And we'll watch our clearances, tolerances, make sure we don't have anything too close to the floor of the car. Work our way back to the tips, and it'll be ready to fire up. Oh, the exhaust went fantastic. Uh, Accurate does such a fine job, you know, of bending all the pipes. I mean, everything just falls into place. So it looks like you got everything all detailed out. Looks great. Thank you. So where do we start though? There's it's quite a lot going on. I know, there's there's so much going on in this thing. But I always okay. start with the tube. Uh, this is what we're gonna start with. This is like the uh, outer shell of the column. But I start with that. It's easy to build it on this because then you can slide things into it and out of it. But this here is the, the main shafts. This is where your steering wheel goes. Is outer tube and this one goes inside of there like that down like that does it matter what end can you tell yeah it's definitely got to go this way this right here has a provision in it to accept this little bearing thing so we got to spin this this way as you can okay. see this is our column thing this will slide right in there like that okay so now we got like our lower part done we won't worry about doing the coupler and all that until we're we're complete now we're going to move to the actual column the actual column has a couple different pieces in it. This is our lower piece. This will go on first, and this will actually support this handle that'll go in there. Okay. So we'll grease this, put that in, get the, the actual column in, and then start building out that lower part. Okay, get to the fun stuff. Exactly. So I've been working on the 70 Roadrunner, and I'm at a point where it's time to get Mark to sign off on some things. I'm about ready to put the trunk floor in and just check over the things that I've been doing on it. This is the car that came in fairly decent shape. It was painted, looked good at a glance, but the owner was kind of a fanatic and it reminded him of his original car that he had. So he really wanted this one dialed into perfection. So you got your sections in. Yep. Are they the same length section on both sides? Yep. Good. And I metal finished them so you can't see where I spliced in. Yeah, don't. No, it looks very nice on the outside. No, I mean, you did good, bye. You, you did good. That looks good, buddy. I like Mark to sign off on things because it's really crucial to have everything exact. 
and if he signs off on it, then I know I'm good to go. And there's less chance of a mistake. All right, Pockets, let's go. Pockets, that's your name. <laughs> Pockets ain't my name. <laughs> Pockets is your name. All right. <laughs> All right, so yeah, we got our bottom of our column in there. And as you okay. can see, whenever this, sh you know, shifts, that's like your gear selector. And then this is hooked on to the transmission? Exactly, yep. Then we just got to keep building out our little column. So now we got to get this part right here on there. So we got this built, I got some grease in there. So when we go in there, we got to fit this column set up in there. So there's all kinds of junk going in here at the same time. Yeah, I got to get it just right. Yeah, so. So is this the last component before you can put on the steering wheel? Yeah, we're getting pretty close. Got our clip in there for our turn signal wiring. Here's our turn signal right here. We got the handle on there. You can kind of see how that operates. Then of course our column shift. You know, when it's in the park, it's locked, which is cool. You don't have to worry about popping out of gear and every other gear will just kind of rotate through. Got our little selector in there that tells it what it's doing when it goes into the different gears, which is neat and it looks yeah. awesome. The paint looks great, it looks amazing. Okay, so the, we put the light in there. So yep. when you have your headlights on, does this click on automatically as well? Exactly, okay. it'll light up this uh, area in there so you can kind of see what gear you're in. That's cool. Which is really neat. I like all yeah. this little detail. Yeah, if you want to grab the steering wheel, we can put that on. And what I'll do is I'll hold this end here so you can kind of feel what it'll go on. Okay, you got her? Start wiggling it on. Perfect. Okay. Okay. So you got That's it. it. That's Does it. Go it. On any further? Well, it'll go on further once we run the bolt and stuff on there. Oh, okay. So we'll go ahead and grab our washer in that lock nut. Yep, that'll go on there like so. Okay, so we got the steering wheel on. What's yep. next? Yeah, you got the steering wheel on. I put on the little horn mechanism. And the way that there kind of works is whenever you operate your horn, it'll move this in and you can see those little metal tabs yeah. touching together. When those tabs touch together, it grounds out and sets off your horn. Now that we got that bracket on there, here's the next piece uh, that's got to go on there. So we'll tighten all these down, and then we can put our horn button on there, which is really cool. So we got our, our horn button on there. So that's how that operates. You can kind of see how that wiggles around and yeah. operates our horn. So now the best part of the whole deal is putting that little Roadrunner medallion in there. So, Are we ready for that yet? Yeah, we're ready really? for it. So yeah, if you want to grab it, that can go in there. And there's a little notch in there, so it only goes in one way. You, yep, the one that goes in there, and then you just got to kind of push the whole thing in in a circular motion. There you go. All right. Now here's a little bit of trivia for you, Georgie. All right. Georgie boy. I know you don't know all the numbers and stuff like you should by now, but neither does Alyssa. They made a little over 20,000 two-door hardtop 383 Roadrunners in 1970. The standard transmission that came behind the 383 was a three-speed manual transmission. Okay. Now, out of that 20,000 plus, only 584 of them actually left the assembly line with the three-speed transmission, meaning that when they when people bought the roadrunners or when they ordered them standard was the three-speed manual transmission but out of 20,000 plus only 584 still have the three-speed people were optioning for the four-speed pistol grip shifter because it was the coolest shifter on the planet and the automatic transmission very few people wanted the three-speed this is one of the 584 three-speed cars Wow. That's kind of one of those trick things that, well, you think in your mind, well, that's really, really rare. Well, it is rare from a production value standpoint, how many they made, but it doesn't make it any more valuable. It probably decreases the value. Most people today are just like they were in 1970. They would rather have a 383 four-speed or a 383 automatic than a 383 three-speed. This car came to the owner that we're doing it for already being converted to a four speed. So we sent that out to brewers having that four speed rebuilt and it's back now over with the drivetrain, which is also by the way, almost done. Uh, so as soon as they're done in body here, we'll reunite all that and put it in. But this car will be on the road with a four speed pistol grip shifter. Want a screw? <laughs> no, thank you on the want and just screw, trying to, you know? just trying to appease to your by curious nature. Uh, the car had got packed full of a lot of plastic filler, uh, and appeared a lot better than it really was. If you look at it, by the time we're done, we're replacing almost every piece of sheet metal on the back half of the car. 
front rails and front inner, uh, fenders. So thank God again, we got auto metal direct to, to be able to pick up the phone and call and order this stuff. Cause if, if we couldn't do this, we'd be knocking a 70 Roadrunner two door hardtop or two door post in the head, taking it away or a satellite or sports satellite. We'd be taking a good, valuable, nice, potential car off the road to make this one whole again. Otherwise, that looks good, Georgie. 70 Roadrunner, 383. What transmission? Uh, Three-speed. Three-speed manual. How many did they build in the two-door hardtop? It came optional, what was it? I want to say 2,000 something, only 20,000 20, 20, something. 70 Roadrunner, only 500 and some rolled off the assembly line with the three-speed okay. in it. So you listened to a little of it. Yeah. Over 20,000 cars were built 383 two door hard tops. Out of that over 20,000, only 584 had a three speed manual transmission. 584. 584. All right. So, try to. Huh? Oh, I thought you oh, no. No. said something. What I'm doing today is I, I brought out a couple of challengers here in the graveyard that. Interestingly enough, a lot of the times I'll get emails from people questioning, you know, what's the difference between a 70 and a 71 Challenger? Now, most Mopar, diehard Mopar guys do know that answer, but a lot of folks don't know the answers. They, they'll say, they'll send pictures, check out my dad's old 71 Challenger, when in fact it was a 1970 Challenger. So I thought it'd be kind of cool since we happen to have two of them that are really, really similar cars, but showing the obvious difference between the 70 and 71, I thought it'd be a great time to just come out here and go over it. 1970, good looking car. This is a purple car, it's black interior. This one is an RT, our 71 is also an RT. In 1970, they made 53,000 and some change. I don't remember, 53,300 total challengers. Over in 71, they made less than half of that. They only made 23,000 and some change. So the real question is, why did they make so few of the 71 versus the 70? Take a look at the front of these cars. Look at the grill work. Now, this one, I was told, the inspiration behind this grill came from the designer who flipped a rock into a pond and as the ripples went out, he thought, how cool would it be to do something like that in a grill? And that's what he did. You see these step ups as it goes back into the actual grill opening itself and this tunnel type shape to it. This is a new style and a new look and that ripple effect look going into it again was just state of the art. That was absolutely groundbreaking coming off of again the 60s where everything was kind of a, a flush mount, ugly in your face grill. And then you get into this kind of a hard to explain look. Now today's Dodges, they sport the crosshair, that, that's their famous look. Is If you look at the grill, it looks like the crosshairs of a rifle. This looks like an early version of it that just needed one of them going up and down like that and you would have had that crosshair look. It got away from the, the recess, it brought it back out again. Again, the grill's black, which it should be on an RT. You look at the two bumpers, they're the same. And the lower valances are the same. Come through here. I don't know which way it's gotta go. Oh, there, there we you go. go. How's that? Yep. You got our steering column in there. Does it look good up there, Royal? And yeah, looks good up here. All the column in there and everything. So cool, it looks awesome. So when it comes to the interiors of the 70 and the 71, uh, literally, there's not much difference between them. The instrumentation is the same, which is that cool uh, cockpit style, 150 mile an hour speedometer, 8,000 RPM tack, all four of your functional gauges and a clock over on the right hand side. Same steering wheel used in 70 and 71. There were optional wheels, but the basic standard wheel was the same. Uh, one note is if you had a 72 on up, they dropped the RPM from 8,000 tack down to a 7,000 RPM tack. The rest of the interior, like I say, for the most part, other than seat patterns are slightly different in 71. The seat backs are different in 1971 versus 1970. This is what you call the two-piece uh, seat back. It uses a long button on the side, a, a piece of pot metal type of outer hinge cover, then the one-piece clamshell back, where the 71 is all one piece with just a button to push it. 
Door panels are the same, the rest the same, floors are the same, headliners are the same, visors are the same, rear view mirrors even the same. So not a lot to report. This car is kind of cool. It's optioned with the six-way seat, but I do believe the six-way seat was also available in 71 optional on the car. This one over here doesn't have that. Okay, so over here on our 71, it's the same basic interior as I said our 70 has. We've got our, our real cool cockpit style instrumentation, 150 speedometer, eight grand tack, full gauges, have our clock over there. The switch panel's the same. Basically everything is the same. The dash pad changed in 71 and uses the Challenger replaceable with Barracuda, because it's the same uh, applique over there. So 70, a Challenger has its own dash pad. 70, a Barracuda has its own dash pad. But in 71, because they were basically shaped the same, they decided to streamline things and just make that little label over there replaceable, whether it would be for a Barracuda or a Challenger. You know, there, are, there, there may be a multitude of reasons why the 70 outsold the 71. I tend to think, it's my opinion, it was the introductory year, and that's a big year, That's as with anything. A lot of people ran down, 53,300 and some people went down and bought that car in some version, be it a convertible, be it an RT, be it a TA, be it a deputy, be it just a standard car, RTSC with the formal back roof. But 53,000 people in the market bought that car. The next year, just less than 12 months later, this one comes out not quite as sexy. They don't add anything. They're taking away some stuff for 1971, like the 375 horsepower 440 Magnum. So all things being equal, that's my opinion as to why they only made half of them. It could just be the fact that the muscle car was declining. It was declining hard and fast. The insurance rates were out of sight. Gas had doubled or tripled with the embargo. Maybe that was the reason they didn't sell. Okay. Where have you been? Dude's been walking out here. Dude has a lot more responsibility than you can imagine. Roll the windows down, turn the key on, the power windows, roll all the windows down, unclasp the convertible top, and then drop it all the way down till it's seated, and then we'll be ready to go. You're doing a good job. Hold your foot down. What in the name of are you doing? Get out. No, tell, okay, tell me it's how to do it. It's a half a million dollar car. No, tell I can't tell you. Tell me how to do you. it. Not I'll one step at a time. I can handle all the steps at once. I don't believe you can. Please let me in there so oh I can start God. it. Thank You're you. Okay. First thing to find out in a Chrysler is to crank it over and see if it wants to start. Having knowledge whether the car's cold or warm. Now and you this had to tell me that's why you were warm. So you shouldn't even need to touch the accelerator. When you touch that accelerator, you flooded it. This is not a fuel injected car. So let's just try cranking it and seeing if it starts with no gas at all. That was a setup. Whoop. Are you kidding Does me? To say it is is. Because I tried to start it. You told me to put my foot on the gas. After you pumped the shit out of it and flooded the poor piece of crap. There's dual four carburetors. You can't just start that gas pedal. You don't even want me to pedal. succeed. Hey, Would you agree that the Roadrunner is ready for its maiden voyage on the open road? It is. We're ready to go. I'm ready more than ever. Let's do this. Give me a thumb, one thumbs up. Three, give me the fourth. There you go. Take a look at those thumbs. Phenomenal car. I mean, what a driver. And I, you haven't got a chance to be out in these things, but some of the cars that I've driven on the initial run don't work out so well because they're cars. There's a thousand pieces that can go wrong. But honestly, this car just smooth as glass, no problems, drove like a dream. Temperature gauge work, fuel gauge works, every, all the instrumentation is just phenomenal.
another one bites the dust. And another one gone, and another one gone, another one bite the dust. Are we done? Hey, I want to get to you, another one Stop bite it, the dust. Yeah. <laughs> uh, uh, uh. Another that? one bite the dust. That's what he says. Bite the dust. Bite the dust. Bite the dust. It's a queen it's from back in the 70s. I grew up on it. It doesn't matter. Okay, the car is done. It's no fun. What's happening? The owners for the Roadrunner are here. So we're getting ready to do the reveal. Do you want to help me grab the guys out here and I'll run and grab the guys up front? I'll get them ready for you. So I'll meet you guys up front. All right, I'll be up there Sounds in five good. minutes. Four. Four, and four. three. Okay, I'm Sounds going good. now. Hey, Dave. Hey, hey, what's up? Getting ready to do the reveal for the Roadrunner. Do you want to come out front with me? We can yeah. we can wait for him. Oh, heck yeah, I'm ready to go. Let's do it. Okay, Oh awesome. yeah, always excited uh, for a reveal. I mean, it's so cool to uh, to meet the owner and actually see their, you know, their expression on their face when they finally see the cars. I mean, this is what we work for. This is the big payoff for us. So this, of course, is the best days. I helped out with air grabber and some of the interior, as well as putting on the decals. So I'm really gonna miss this car. This was one of my favorites. I think I've said that about all of the ones I've helped on because yep. you kind of grow fond of it once you spend enough time. But this one's definitely my favorite. It's Convertible, it's a beautiful turquoise color with the red accents, it has the Roadrunner on it. I mean, I just love it. It's gonna be hard to see it, but it's also gonna be really cool to see the reaction of Daryl. Hi, guys. Hi, how you doing? Hey, how's it going? Hello, how good, are you? how are you? Pretty Name's good. Name's Alyssa. I'm Daryl Smith, and my uh, 69 Hemi Roadrunner convertible is just finished restoration, and I'm coming to pick it up. Nice yes. to meet you. How are you doing, Daryl? Hey, how are you? Good, good to see ya. So it was awesome to bring all the guys from the paint and body shop out front on this reveal, because they're really the guys that do a lot of the work, you know, so it kind of helps keep them going when they when they get a thank you. You know, that goes a long ways. He was never a big fan of- No, what, I ain't team. He was never a big fan of the whole crew coming out for reveals. Um, Did I'm you a see huge, the old crew? I, so where's my car, Mike? Huh, where is your car? Yeah. I don't know. Okay. I uh, I don't know where my dad's at. Do yeah. you know where he's at? No, no, he's always no uh, one knows. Yeah, always fashionably late. So we're waiting on Mark. Like always. Yeah, exactly. The last time I saw it was probably six months ago. It was pretty much painted, but it was still hadn't been assembled yet. The engine and trans weren't in yet. None of the interior. No drivetrain at all. Just a body with. Uh, Nice looking paint. Right. And none of you know where it is. <laughs> they just told us to come out front for the reveal. Oh, I hear it. Oh, you can hear it now. Oh, look at that. There it is. Look at that thing. Yeah, the car comes down the road. It sounds amazing. I mean, you can see Daryl start to perk up when he when he oh, hears yeah. it coming. I mean, nothing like the sound of a Hemi uh, through that dual exhaust, you know, from accurate. I mean, it sounds awesome. And Wow, beautiful, huh? Amazing, look at that. The color is amazing. Yeah, it is. That's... It's just incredible. The color just lightens up tremendously and it looks, it just looks awesome. Hey, get out of the car, my turn. Come on, man. I get to drive <laughs> it once in a while. I get all the work Dang. on it. Look at this color. Is that a gorgeous this color? This car or looks what? awesome out here, Hello, brother. Hey. How'd you like the sound of that? The sun. Yeah, I heard that. <laughs> Hello, Hi, darling. Awesome. How are you? I'm doing good. By the way, I, di I didn't approve that. Uh, I never went over 2,000 RPM. And <laughs> our original contract said that, so. Hey, that Big Daryl. Beautiful. Car. 69 Hemi Roadrunner convertible. What'd you do cam wise on that? Because I guess I'm not familiar it's, with that. It's you a know? stock 70 hydraulic cam. For a hydraulic Hemi, for a normal Hemi. For a Hemi, yeah. It's got such a nice bump to it, and it's, it's so perfect. responsive, yeah. And hopefully I never have to take the valve covers off to adjust the valve. I hope you never have to do that. They're not easy. They're not easy. It's not easy to even get them off, let alone once yeah. they're off. 
This car is awesome. <laughs> it really is pretty. It's a nice color. A no excuse car. It's amazing to me how how something like this has survived so long. And and I will say, in fairness to the car, I've driven the car. Yeah, I was gonna check the rear tires to see the wear. There's on. still plenty of tire. Okay. It's the second set. Yeah, that's what yeah. I thought. <laughs> what are you doing? Huh? <laughs> Judas. <laughs> no, we didn't Had smoke the first set of tires off. But it just drives so nice. And I attribute it to the guys that did a great job on the car, but also the fact that I think it started life as a good car. It, it was taken care of since about 76 on. Yeah. I'm going to ask you, because I know you know your numbers probably as good as I do, especially on cars like this. How many did they make total Hemi Automatics? Six. Six total US Hemi production. Automatics. U.S. production. Yeah. None of them went to Canada. Were the four speeds of Canadians? There was three Canadian cars, but there was only 10 U.S. production cars. And of those, how many are painted Q5 Seafoam Turquoise? That one right there. Only car in the world, only folks. One, yeah. Only car in the world. Just in case you fell asleep in the commercials or took an extended bathroom break, here's what happened. Dave knocked out the remaining interior on the Roadrunner convertible. He and Mark installed the factory replicated mild steel exhaust. Then Dave teamed up with Alyssa and Royal to build out and install the steering wheel. Mark checked in with Ryan on the Superbird Tribute headlights and George on the 1970 Roadrunner's metalwork. But hey, don't forget Will. He touched up the paint and buffed the Hemi Roadrunner. Plus, he told all the body shop guys to meet him out front. That may not seem like a lot, but, well, okay. Uh, maybe he had a busy week. Finally, Daryl Smith showed up to see his newly restored, one-of-a-kind 1969 Hemi Roadrunner convertible in the very rare Q5 Turquoise. But the big question is, will Alyssa get to drive it? Come on, it's a half a million dollar car. What do you think? And, yeah, I was going to say and a quarter. Well, you got to add something when you're down to five. <laughs> Well, hey, Mom and Dad, is that looking good? It is. Yeah. It is. Yeah. Like a brand new car. Probably better than it did when they were new. Oh, hell yeah. <laughs> hell yeah. <laughs> Meet me. <laughs> well, it's the first time I've driven it for about four years, and the car handles incredible. Braking was good, cornering was good, and performance is excellent. And the car looks really sharp. My wife was thrilled when I got on it. She thought it was one of the greatest running cars she's ever been in. And it was a lot of fun. I enjoyed it. Well, the last time I drove it, it felt pretty loose and it, it had a tendency to wander around in the lane. And now it feels real tight. Uh, it's, there's no softness to it. It just, it rides good, it corners good. It's just really nice. It's, it's right on. My friend, right. sure, thank you very thank much. You. I appreciate all your patience. I know it took a little longer, but I, I hope in the end you're happy, happy, happy. Happy, happy, yeah. Thank I you, am. sweetheart. It's nice okay. to see you. <laughs> nice to see you. And thank you for coming up, honey. Place. It was <laughs> nice to see you again. Car's beautiful. Owner's having a ball. The car runs and drives and tracks. He lets go of the steering wheel, and it's just tracking down the road great. Royal did a phenomenal job on the alignment. Brakes feel great. Dave's assembly is amazing. Cool. So be careful, and we'll see you in a couple of weeks with a beautiful car. All right. Uh, Bye. Travel safe. See you later. Bye. Take care. Drive safe. Okay. Back to work. Ooh, that's mine. <laughs>